2012 was predicted to be the year that the world would end, according to the Mayan calendar. It's a good thing that it didn't, because the very next year, a band called Death Heaven put out an album called Sunbather. This album changed the face of extreme metal and managed to garner praise from outlets not traditionally known for reviewing heavy metal. Not just that, but it came to define an entire genre as we know it. This isn't the first time I've brought it up, but I felt like it deserved a little more attention than I've already given it. In today's video, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the album. The band that made it, the background behind it, and the music itself. Let's cut to the chase. <laughs> I've already discussed the history of Deaf Heaven in another video, so I'll try to zoom through their history before this album. Deaf Heaven was formed in 2010 by two San Francisco residents, vocalist George Clark and guitarist Carrie McCoy. They played a style of metal called Black Gaze, which combines the screamed vocals and fast guitar of black metal with the ethereal and dreamlike atmospheres of shoegaze. They recruited three additional members to release their debut album, Roads to Judah, in 2011. The album was well received by critics and got a decent amount of attention for a debut. In my personal opinion, while it's not groundbreaking by any measures, it's a very enjoyable listen and it's as good as Death Heaven could have done at that point in their existence. During the touring cycle for this album, the three other musicians all left the band, leaving George and Carrie at square one. Undeterred, they recruited drummer Daniel Tracy and decided he was all they needed to head back in the studio to record a follow-up. Now operating as a three-piece, the band entered Atomic Garden Studios in East Palo Alto, California, to work with producer and engineer Jack Shirley. He had worked with the band previously, so the decision to go with him for this album was an easy one. In an interview with Pop Matters, George said that he felt the material they had written was both the darkest and lightest music they had made, which I suppose isn't a paradox? The songwriting process was dominated by Carrie, which is to be expected since he was the only member of the band who played a stringed instrument. Incredibly, the entire recording process took only six days. This makes a little more sense when considering that there were only three members to deal with. Carrie just recorded all the guitars and bass himself. As for what each day was spent on, I created this handy dandy little chart. I will say I disagree with the decision to do the guitars before the bass. Good luck staying in time without a full rhythm section, you six-string twerps. This is apparently their first release where they actually paid attention to how the drums sounded. In an article for Invisible Oranges, they mentioned how previously all that mattered to them was speed, which is an easy trap to fall into for a heavy metal band. This album, however, they really focused on how the drums could affect how a certain section sounded, given Daniel Tracy's skill. I especially like how he used a rather small drum kit, with only a kick, snare, hi-hat, two toms, and two cymbals. Sometimes that's all you need, no offense to Neil Peart. After this quick recording process, the album was mixed, mastered, and fully completed. Let's see how the songs sound, shall we? But before that, I gotta discuss the album cover, designed by Nick Steinhardt, guitarist of Touche Amore. Given that it's just a color field with some text, I'm surprised at how much I ended up loving it. Pink isn't a color that's usually used in metal artwork, but somehow it just fits. The cover is apparently supposed to look like what you see when you look at the sun with your eyes closed. For legal purposes, I have to, uh, say that I do not encourage any of you to do that. Okay, enough stalling. On to the music. The album opener, the nine-minute Dream House, starts out with Carrie playing a fast, reverb, and distortion-heavy riff without any other instruments backing him. When they do finally kick in after about 25 seconds, it's overpowering. The way the instruments are mixed makes it sound massive and yet comforting at the same time. It's as if the music is enveloping you. When the vocals kick in, it only adds to this effect, as George's screams sound harsh yet ethereal. The song manages to keep up a fast pace for nearly four minutes before they gradually slow down and play one final chord, letting it ring out. Just when you think that might be the end, however, it segues into a section that's just Carrie playing clean guitar. The song is really best listened to in a quiet setting, because if you listen to it during a road trip or on a plane ride, it's very likely that you won't be able to properly hear a lot of the softer moments, which would really suck. It's very hard to write a guitar lick that sounds perfect with no other instrumental backing, but the clean section Carrie plays is just that. It's reflective, melancholic, whatever other adjectives you can use. Just when you think that's the ending, though, the rest of the band kicks in with a 
bang! The rest of the song has a mid-paced, head-banging riff while George screams and Carrie ends things with a dreamlike lead guitar line. This is usually the song to close their performances with, and I can definitely see why. The lyrics to this song are quite vague. However, lines such as, hindered by sober restlessness, and the poor of a bitter red being, hint at a theme of alcoholism. The final verse, if you can call it that, is especially noteworthy. I'm dying. Is it blissful? It's like a dream. I want to dream. This is apparently copied from a text conversation George had with the girl while he was absolutely hammered. I don't know if it fits with the song, but I don't care. What can I say? I'm a sucker for vague poetry. I even had I want to dream tattooed on my right wrist. If Deaf Heaven ever gets cancelled, I can just lie and say that I made it up. George also said that the song was somewhat inspired by wealth inequality. As he put it, I would get off work and walk around at nighttime, working a shitty job all day, getting off at 11 o'clock, only to look up at these high-rise apartments. The lights are still on, and you can see inside that everything's meticulous, beautiful, and expensive. In San Francisco, there's this increasing divide of wealth. There are the people I know who have family who's really wealthy and they can skim by. They go to school, but it's all paid for. Or you have people who are sharing a room with two other people, sleeping on a couch. They'll work a monotonous job. We truly do live in a society. Up next is the song Irresistible. I should mention that this album is seven tracks, with four proper songs and three interludes. This is the result of Carrie writing lots of clean little licks that the band couldn't figure out how to fit into an actual song, but they didn't exactly want to discard them, per se. This is the first interlude, and I'd say it's the only one that can be listened to on its own as an actual song. The song consists almost entirely of Carrie's clean guitar playing, eventually layering five separate parts, thus rendering it impossible to ever play live, barring multiple guest musicians. The song ends with a simple piano line after a little over three minutes. This is just a really nice, peaceful, simple little song. Don't really have much to say about it. This segues into the title track. The opening riff sounds quite uplifting, if that makes sense. I just want to smile whenever I hear it. The song stays mid-paced until about 2 minutes and 45 seconds in when we get a nice clean guitar section. Once this part ends, the heaviness comes back with a vengeance, and they don't let up tempo-wise. Probably my favorite part of the song happens about 5 minutes and 50 seconds in. George lets out an absolutely tortured scream, Carrie plays an ethereal melodic lick, and Daniel provides the backbone with pounding double bass drums. Soon, there's another soft section, although this one actually has more than just guitar. It also has something quite unusual. A bass lead. The bass guitar on this album isn't really worth talking about too much, since the style of music being played doesn't require very intricate bass lines. In this part, however, Carrie plays a simple but nonetheless beautiful line on bass. After this section concludes, the heaviness comes back in in what's a very cathartic moment, and the song finishes not too long after. The lyrics for this song are a little less cryptic than those on Dreamhouse. At least the first part is. The first couple of lines describe George driving through a wealthy neighborhood, ogling a sunbathing woman, and overall feeling jealous. Then it gets into some weird stuff. I do particularly like the closing lyrics, though. It's 5 a.m. and my heart flourishes at each passing moment. Always and forever. Always and forever was almost what I got tattooed on my wrist. I should mention the meaning behind the title, Sunbather. George said in an interview that the title was inspired by the time he was cutting class and noticed a woman sunbathing. He thought that she looked so peaceful and content with her life, and he couldn't help but wonder what decisions she had made to get to that point, and if he would ever feel as content as she probably was. Oh damn, I'm getting all existential now. After this is the second interlude, Please Remember. The song is notable for having the only guest appearance on the whole album. Nej, frontman and songwriter of fellow Black Gaze legends Alcest, contributes a spoken word track. He reads out a section of Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Twisting and turning beside the slumbering Teresa, he recalled something she had told him a long time before in the course of an insignificant conversation. They had been talking about his friend, Z, when she announced, If I hadn't met you, I'd certainly have fallen in love with him. Even then, her words had left Tomas in a strange state of melancholy, and he now realized it was only a matter of chance that Teresa loved him and not his friend, Z. Apart from her consummated love for Tomas, there were, in the realm of possibility, an infinite number of unconsummated loves for other men. 
We all reject out of hand the idea that the love of our life may be something light or weightless. We presume our love is what must be, that without it our life would no longer be the same. We feel Beethoven himself gloomy and awe-inspiring, his playing to our own great love. Lighten up, Francis. <laughs> Musically speaking, the song features a lot of weird dissonant noises for the first half, some of which sound like they're being played in reverse. The second half is a lot more peaceful, featuring some acoustic guitar strumming over which Carrie plays a simple slide guitar line. The next proper song, Vertigo, is the longest on the entire album, at just over 14 and a half minutes. It starts out quite chill, with there being only clean guitar, bass, and drums for the first three and a half minutes. Once a distortion does kick in, it stays at around rather mid-paced tempo while Carrie plays a pseudo guitar solo that sounds quite nice. The song kicks into high speed five minutes in and that's also a point where George finally wakes up and starts doing his vocalizing. At the ten and a half minute mark, the clean guitar makes a return, which is a nice break from all the headbanging. Eventually the band returns to playing heavy music and they play at a rather slow pace until the end of the song. Lyrically speaking, the song is a little tricky to figure out. Genius says it relates to looking back on your past mistakes and how they've impacted to your current state. This would fit in with the overall theme of the album, as mentioned before. In addition, the title could also be another reference to Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness of Being. I've been looking for book wrecks, so thanks, Death Heaven. The third and final interlude track, Windows, features two different field audio recordings, the first of which is of a street preacher in San Francisco ranting about hell, and the second as of a drug deal. Carrie was addicted to opiates during the album's recording, and the band figured that a recording of personal demons fit quite well with a recording discussing actual demons. The album's closing track, The Pecan Tree, starts out with one of the most killer sections on the entire album. The drums are blasting, the guitars are fast, and George's screaming is tortured. If I may discuss a bit of music theory for a second, I love it when the rhythm guitar changes the chord of a section, but the lead keeps playing the exact same line. It's a small thing, but I love it. This continues until a little over four minutes in when the song takes a complete 180. We cut to Carrie playing a slightly ominous sounding clean riff. After this plays for a bit, we get one of the most beautiful clean sections on the album. Carrie plays peaceful arpeggios, Dan adds nice touches with his cymbal flourishes, and George plays a piano line that's simple but beautiful. Finally, with about four minutes left, the heaviness returns with a smashing crescendo. Carrie plays an ethereal mid-paced riff while George continues screaming for the remainder of the song, and the album fades out at two seconds under an hour long. Lyrically, this song is about George's troubled childhood. In an interview with Pitchfork, he said, It's definitely a direct thing to my actual dad. We actually got back in touch and have a better relationship now, but I've always had this thing where I've always seen my parents as people from a very young age. My mom really instilled in me this idea that parents are not perfect and they make mistakes. My dad is happy, but there's something deep down that's discontent with him. After my mom and him split up, and they had a very short marriage, he never remarried and he lives at home alone. He always has. Our family took a few big blows in the last couple of years and a lot of it was weighed on him. Again, it's not a single story, but these different pieces that come together from a feeling of disappointment and sadness. And I saw a lot of that in me, and it really got me down. I had the idea to become really emotionally detached, and a lot of the time I have treated people that I've cared about a lot really unfairly. So I wanted to share his identity because I felt like we were so similar. So that song is more about my empathy with him. I particularly love the final lyrics. I am my father's son. I am no one. I cannot love. It's in my blood. A bit cheesy, but screamed the way George does it. It just feels so good. The album was released on June 11th of 2013, and received what Wikipedia described as widespread critical acclaim. Just look at all these stars. It was named the best metal album of 2013 by Spin, Stereo Gum, Rolling Stone, you heard that right, Rolling Stone, and Pitchfork. Rolling Stone would go on to declare it the 94th best metal album of all time. NPR would even give it a shout out in their annual 50 favorite albums list. 
although I doubt you'll hear them playing their music anytime soon. Death Heaven has since expanded to be more than a trio, and they've released three more really good albums. I'm probably not going to do a whole video about any of them in the future, although if you want to hear me discuss them briefly, I suggest you check out the video I did covering their whole discography. Now that I've done a fair bit of talking, I want you to do a fair bit of listening. Go listen to Sunbather all the way through, whether it be on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, or whatever you use. If you like it, then congratulations, you have more music to add to your rotation. If not, hey, at least you tried something new. If you're still watching by this point, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me your time. If you like what you saw, be sure to like and hit subscribe. I upload these videos whenever I can, and I always have a ton of fun making them. Hopefully you have as much fun watching them. If you have an idea for a video you want me to do, uh, leave it down in the comments. Who knows, maybe I'll get to it. I'm RobbyJ2734. I will see you when I see you next.